real estate is a very powerful tool of using the right in the right way. So, you know, we're just very grateful. We, we you know, we don't really sell anything. We just kind of bring value, hope that people can, can, you know, connect to our story, connect to kind of what we do and basically attract investors instead of going out and trying to convince people to invest instead attract investors and attract them to our story and what we've been able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Real Estate Hustlers Podcast. I am your host, Josh Appleman, founder and CEO of Appleman Properties. Today, we're joined with Jefferson and John Ortiz. Uh, they both founded Ortiz Equity Group in 2019. They have amassed 166 units with 178 more under contract. Uh, Jefferson we're and John, we're, we're happy to have you here today. If you could let the listeners know a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We definitely appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about our journey. Um, yeah, so it all actually started with us. We're actually originally from Colombia, and then we immigrated to Canada uh, just right about 2002. No, no, that was back early, early 2000s, I want to say. Um, and then we grew up in Canada our whole life. You know, grew up, I myself, uh, right after high school, ended up becoming an insurance broker. And then John went into the logistics industry, and I know he can touch a little bit on, on exactly what, what his role was. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of just follow the, the, the normal path that most people do, go to school, get a job um you know uh work a nine to five and eventually try to retire from that and um and yeah we we didn't really we didn't really find that that was what we wanted to do we wanted to do more we wanted to you know we had that entrepreneur bug you know like most people we read rich that poor dad um and it was actually sent to us by somebody who wasn't an investor he was just this ordinary guy john's friends actually and um and that kind of led you know to a whole path of like financial freedom you know trying to try to learn a little bit about that and then in 2020, we started our wholesale company. That's how we got it started in real estate. So we started a wholesale company. And our first year, we did, you know, we did close to about 40 deals, like between 37 to 40 wholesale deals. We also picked up some smaller multifamily properties. And again, this happened all in Canada. And then, um, yeah, 2020, we, we picked up some smaller multifamily, did the whole burst strategy. Um, and then what we found is that we didn't really want to invest in Canada uh, for many reasons much like, you know, the, there's no inventory, like the hundred plus units, there's no inventory in that sense. Um, there's no, the regulations are much, very much in the, in the tenant friendly. So it's very hard to scale that way. And then we just, you know, we wanted to invest somewhere where we wanted to invest, oh, sorry, where, where we wanted to travel. And that's kind of what led us to look in the North Carolina, South Carolina. And, uh, and then we joined a community, we joined a mastermind and then we got an opportunity to become part of a deal, 137 units in Charleston, South Carolina. We're actually in the midst of selling that asset currently as we speak and it's, it's been it's been a pretty good learning experience and and good to be you know foot on the ground and yeah it's kind of where we are right now now we're focusing on helping canadians invest passively in the us as well as americans and uh and then, yeah we as you mentioned we have another 100 170 plus units in uh, in georgia that we're uh, getting close to close on so that's uh you know in a nutshell a little bit of a we can kind of dive into a little bit john anything you want to add no you you touched on all the, all the good points yeah uh you know, for the last couple of years, we've just been building that corporate structure to be able to help Canadians passively invest in the U.S. As you know, obviously, there is a border um, in between. So, you know, learning the whole corporate structures, um, tra doing transactions with lawyers that are able to do both sides and just building a system, uh, a CRM uh, database and making sure that we have everything in place to be able to go out there hunt deals and help Canadians uh, hit double digit returns, something we can't really get here in, in Canada. Yeah, Canada's uh, tough with real estate in general. What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, it has to do with a lot of the laws, a lot of the laws and a lot of the regulation that goes on in Canada. Um, you know, so basically, just kind of backtrack a little bit. One of our first purchases was a duplex and where we had a tenant that wasn't paying and it took us almost a year before we got her out. And she essentially got away with a year of not paying rent, damaging the property. And she kind of walked away free and clean. So it's kind of the system, the way the way the system is built, is not really meant for for entrepreneurs or landlords, in my opinion, right? Of course, you know you can still do it, but it's just it's a lot more challenging. A lot it takes you a lot more longer to execute your business plan if if it is a value add opportunity. Yeah, even like home prices, from what from what I read and and here, home prices are so out of touch with with what reality is, and it's just and then inventory, there's no nothing to really buy, and it's if you can't buy, it's too expensive to even afford it. Is that yes. right? That is correct. As you know, majority of the Canadian population lives right across the border between Toronto and Montreal, and there's a huge housing crisis. So there isn't enough supply 
for the demand that that there is as well as the amount of immigration that the government lets in a year everybody wants to live in that same little bubble close to toronto close to the metropolis metropolis cities and it's just it's hard it's hard for people to afford homes and there isn't just enough supply so and, and, it, and it's really hard to build i would say i would add to that it's really hard to build the government makes it really hard it takes a long time there's a lot of fees associated with that so builders are not really incentivized to build here so you know it, it creates this this backlog of, of housing that never comes on the market that's wild that's um that's what politics got the uh the different uh regimes in office and they can make it uh, either thrive or, or make it tough. Um, and, and you can see it a little bit in the States as well, right? Some of the blue states yeah. compared to the red states, how some are thriving, some are not thriving, the crime, all these things. I think it's, it's kind of shows you the, the both sides of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, so that's, that's good. So you're, you're looking at, um, you're looking at opportunities in, um, in the States, good markets. That way you, you all can create passive income for your, your investors. Um, explain to the listeners the the concept of passive passively investing in multifamily yes absolutely it's something that we were introduced to and we really really like the concept of allowing essentially obviously depending on your on your type of raise that you're doing there's 506 b and 506 c 506 being friends and family 506 being accredited investors i guess that's the first thing to touch on and then the other thing is that obviously let's say you're a busy professional and you want to invest in real estate but you don't have the time you don't have the knowledge you don't have the expertise well, you can partner with a with a group like ourselves or a group like yourselves and, and essentially invest passively in a large asset that otherwise wouldn't be allowed. You know, you wouldn't be really able to put together because there's the financing, the finding the deal, the underwriting, the asset management. So essentially people can invest uh, just like you would invest in any other uh, investment clause, except this one actually gives you a good return, uh, you know, typically a cash on cash return. But then you don't have to do anything. You can enjoy the, the beautiful things of life and. Um, we actually just created a web. We we just we did a webinar uh, a few weeks ago, and where we showed people how you could get to you know close to ten thousand dollars of passive income through passive investing over you know a ten to fifteen year period, and it, it really goes to show you how you can really build that wealth. You know, a lot of people talk about building financial freedom, creating getting cash, uh, passive income, but from there to executing and actually getting it, there's a lot more moving pieces. Um, anything you want to add, John? No, no, Jeff, you, you, you touched on all the good points, but um, yeah, mainly just helping, you know, people that don't really understand um, the basics or the foundation of investing in large apartment buildings, especially in the U.S. Uh, we have nothing like it in Canada. So people will usually put their funds or their savings in an RSP or a TFSA account where they're just getting, you know, 4.5 cash on cash the most. Not and, even, I would say even lower than that. So uh, yeah, probably people. lower than that. And we're, we're able to, you know, be able to, multiply their their investment and give them a good um a good cash on cash return year over year and our our huge criteria when we're investing is the value add so we're when, when we're underwriting deals we're okay we're also investing a huge portion of our money because we believe in this deal and our investors are behind us making sure that you know they're getting what we're investing into as well yeah yeah for sure let's let me take a step backwards because i like to start on the onset, you all got into real estate. You started doing wholesaling. Uh, let's talk about how you all started and built and then scaled that company. Cause there's, that's cool that you all started with wholesaling cause it's fundamentals. It gives you all the transactional process, uh, gives, it gives the person a transactional process. And then it's a way of, of also creating revenue in order to do and get into other deals too. So I'll let y'all, if you could touch for the listeners, touch on that piece. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so when it came to investing in real estate, I'll be honest with you, me and John growing up, we didn't know this was a path. We didn't know this was a route. We didn't know you could become, you know, we become an investor. We didn't know that was a, a route or a path that you could go. You know, we, like most people, that nine to five, you know, go to school, work for somebody. That was the normal path. So what we did is we essentially learn about real estate. Wholesaling some very attractive because you can make money up front without really putting much capital and without actually closing on any deals, but you're still getting some of those prof profits. Um, so essentially we hired a coach in December, that was December 2020. And then that was, I would say that's what uh, allowed us to scale our, our wholesale business because then it gave, it gave us confidence when we're going out talking to a seller. And essentially for wholesaling, for the listeners that may not know, is you find a good opportunity or somebody who is motivated, you lock the property on the contract, and then you find a buyer, you assign your rights to that contract, to the buyer, and depending on how good the deal, I mean, we've done deals as, as big as forty or fifty thousand dollars per deal per transaction, uh, right? So, so that's essentially 
we're essentially helping the seller because they're in a distressed situation, but then we're also helping the buyer get good deals, you know, get amazing returns. Um, so that's kind of how we started. And then, like you mentioned, Josh, that's a really good point. You do get to build on the fundamentals of real estate, which is find a good deal, underwrite a good deal, negotiate a good deal, do diligence on a deal. So I really feel like that part of our business really trans uh, transition into multifamily because now we're just dealing with a different product and and of course a, a much bigger asset but yeah wholesaling I, I me and john always encourage people to start there or at least get familiar with getting off market deals underwriting the deals just just get familiar with the process um because you know the once you go once you go through it once you can do it multiple times and yeah now we got to a point where we got employees you know we got folks that are doing the walkthroughs they're doing all the other uh, ounces of it because we've done it so many times we're able to build that build that uh from scratch um yeah the uh, are you all now buying and renovating and selling? Or are you still doing wholesaling? Yeah, so so we still got our wholesale active business. We're just not as involved with it as much uh, as before because we do have have outsourcing. We built some systems around it. Our main focus in bread and butter is the multifamily, especially yeah. in the U.S. Now, keep in mind, we are still acquiring assets in Canada. However, we have really strategic partnerships in Canada that and where we're not really actively as actively involved. We're finding the deals. We're passing on to our partner. He takes it to the finish line essentially but in the states we're following operations you know we're looking at deals we're underwriting deals we just see the we just see the vision in the states we see the future we see what what can be done and the way you're able to scale up and it's it's a no-brainer um the states is, is kind of where we yeah. want to be uh planted our seed and, and yeah and i like forward. that and i'm sure your investors they, they like the the fact that you all you all are active with uh with other businesses as well it keeps you keeps your knife sharp your act sharp as uh, as far as keeping your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the markets out there because uh, single family has a lot to do with just the economy in general. It's a uh, it's a it's a triple down effect. If um, if um, trading uh, trading slows down or stops in single family, it affects a lot more than just the housing market. Um, as far as service providers, material providers, just on and on and on. So having that Absolutely. having that as an arm of the company, it kind of it helps offset some other different things as well um absolutely i mean we're, we do we do a lot of marketing and, and what we're finding right now with sellers specifically or owners of, of houses and, and buildings of course is that they're over leveraged they bought things that were not assets they overpaid for it and now they're in a really messy situation where they were on a variable rate their mortgage payments were 1700 now they're up to 3000 or more so now they're in a situation where they don't know what to do right so and i think we're going to continue to see that not only in canada but in the states as well um, so just people that are just over leveraged, they, they didn't buy assets, right? Like we, like we, we, we tell people an asset has to be producing income. If it's taking money out of your pocket, it's not an asset, it's a liability. Um, I yeah. think the other, um, hidden piece is you've got a, gr a house on a great interest rate. And then you've got, uh, some people went out and took a second mortgage on it with say a six or 7% interest rates. And you've got a blended, uh, five and a half, your, your, no matter what your payments went up and now you've got just other elements that are coming in. It makes it uh, untangible to to meet your obligations on a monthly basis. There's there's elements happening in the markets right now. There we still know what uh, what the results are going to be. But uh, very cool. I, I was reading on um, uh, one of your case studies. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you this: How does a hundred k investment turn into one point five million in ten years? So I wanted you to get into this one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can touch on it. John can touch on it a little bit as well. We did a webinar on it where we simply just took a, a, a case study example, not, not a particular us, but what we've seen in terms of, you know, uh, returns and whatnot. And essentially what it is, is that first, the first thing is you have to come up with 100,000. So whether it's, you know, whether you um, uh, learn a high income skill or whether you sell an asset or whether you sell a profit, the, the main goal is to have 100,000 of, of money to play with in the first place. Now you take that a uh, hundred thousand investment again. These are those projections. These are not, you know, not set in stone. But you take that a hundred thousand investment, you invest it into a syndication that gives you between seven to ten percent cash on cash return. And then typically, because these are landlord friendly states, you are able to turn over the units as the leases come up for for renewal. So essentially, you're able to, you know, again give a return to your investors. So let's say year over year, you're they're getting a between eight to ten percent cash on cash. But then at the end of the third or fourth year, which is typically between three to five years, it allows you to, to execute your business plan, renovate the units. Uh, by that time, by the third or fourth year, you're then able to take that 100,000 and essentially the plan is that it should turn into 200 to 250,000, 2x your money essentially, right? 
So if you do that over, you know, over a period, right, and you do it over and over again, and you just keep investing, reinvesting your proceeds instead of going out and buying liabilities, you know, that that investment of a hundred thousand will turn to two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand will turn into four hundred thousand in a couple of years, that four hundred thousand will turn into eight hundred thousand. And by the time you're in your 12, 13th year, that that eight hundred thousand would have turned into uh, one point four million essentially, I believe, give or take. And then, if you invest one point four million dollars into a syndication that is providing you between eight to ten, you know, even seven, even call it seven to ten percent cash on cash, that's the formula. So that's that's kind of what we've seen, and that we've seen other operators and other people that just keep investing their proceeds, and essentially that one hundred thousand will turn into one point four million. But more important than that is that that one point four million of uh, the cash on cash on that. The returns are, you know, between ten to fifteen thousand, depending again between seven to ten percent cash on cash, and that is literally a roadmap of how you can create that ten to fifteen thousand. Now, what we found is some people were like, "Well, that's too long, right? Like ten, fifteen, even call it twenty years. That's too long." But then, yeah, they go work a nine to five in exchange forty, fifty years of their life. But uh, you know, but 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 you know, ten to fifteen years. Yeah, fifteen years will come sooner or later. That's uh, <laughs> part of it. But yeah, if you can take out your uh, call it two and a half, three years, take out your initial uh, uh, equity. I mean, you're, you're riding on an infinite there on. So it's in uh, the return is you never, you don't have your initial capital and just pull it out, put it wherever you would normally put it. And then your, uh, your ride is uh, infinite uh, return from there on. It's very cool. Very cool. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so obviously it depends and uh, you, you touch on it as well, right? It depends on what the business plan is. I would say, obviously our plan is mainly to sell, but obviously there's a chance to refinance and recoup that money that's that's another that's another opportunity but you know like you mentioned josh if you refinance it you give your investor their capital back like you said now we're talking about infinite returns right or if we sold the asset then you should essentially 2x your money so it's a win-win thing we go through but that was kind of just the the roadmap that we created but yeah you you touch on it right away um you refinance it pull out yeah, the and, capital, you're, and i, th I think there's good. a lot of uh, young professionals that when they first get their 100,000 and they want to go out there and invest they don't most often make the right decision. So we try to educate them as much as we can. Like, hey, on this asset class, we're able to control the value by the net operating income. And so we kind of educate them on this is what we do. But most of them, you know, they might go out there, they might buy a car, they might try to do their first flip and get into the trenches. And then they're like, oh, screw it and back out and then kind of lose their investment. So we try to educate people as much as we can about the fundamentals of real estate and then um, large syndications, which is which is what we focus on. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they don't uh, they don't see the the alternative asset investing out there. They just you think of investing, you think of the stock market, you think of um uh, your your 401k or yeah. even the stock uh, market funds. right now can take a huge turn with all the political stuff that's going on between the u.s and china right yeah. like it can take it can take a huge flip anytime and you have no control over it no control over it, yeah 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 at least uh, you still can go out and feel touch and see the bricks or siding <laughs> on the uh <laughs> on the houses so um how do you all manage the investment si process the cycle once you um once you have somebody comes to you and they find interest how do you manage the entire entire cycle of it yeah yeah absolutely so so our main focus because we are based out of canada our main focus is on investors relations and asset management um however we do have a pretty good and experienced team that we work with uh in in terms of on the ground boots on the ground managing the asset uh, you know executing the business plan so we just kind of align with with a really good team with a track record and then essentially we're focused on the raising equity and then asset management so yeah we we have just strategic partnerships and where we bring the investors, you know, we buy the asset with, alongside with our partners, and then we just start executing a business plan. We have our, our own in-house property management team with our team, and then um, we already have bought assets in near the, where this area is, where where these assets are. So it just kind of rinse and repeat because we already have executed on that performer on the rent. So that's kind of essentially um, how I would say we operated. So just very strategic partnerships and working with folks that have been doing this a lot longer than we have. So that way we can make sure we're bringing the best of the best when it comes to performing, uh, executing the business plan, underwriting, and, and so on. Anything you want to, John? No, Jeff, that, that is correct. You know, um, as most syndicators know, the most important thing about syndication is is team. Um, and we, we have a team that we've been working with for the last couple of years, and we're like butter and uh, like peanut butter and jelly. We, we work off each other very well, and we're able to use their... Um, 
their team and they're able to use our team and we just connect really well and able to bring on investors and they have a really good asset management team and that Sunbelt region where they do North Carolina, Savannah, and you know, we travel down there every couple of weeks and we sit down with the asset management team, see how they're performing, um, see how the asset is performing and and yeah, no, it it all works really well. And then yeah, and then we have and then we have quarter every quarter we have uh, updates, you know, regular updates of the asset. We do uh, every week. We hop on a call with the whole asset management team. We go over performance, um, you know, vacancies, uh, so and so on. So that's essentially how you know because of because you're buying a bigger asset, you are able to leverage you know the leasing office. Then you have the property management, and then we have the asset management. So essentially, there's three categories of of people that are looking at the asset and managing the asset, as opposed to a single family, a duplex. It's going to be yourself and your property management, and the property manager is not gonna is not gonna uh he's not going to focus on that asset as much because it's so small right they're not they're not getting paid as much so then then they're not going to you know manage it as well as they would a, a bigger asset yeah and, and then that's what that's kind of like why we transitioned into fully owner owner uh, operator we uh we had third party property management in front of us we would buy the asset renovate it. while we're renovating we'd have to lean on the property manager and there's just a break in communication a break on being able to really push hard, push down on the pedal and get full performance out of the property. Now we're able to leverage and squeeze expenses as hard as we want to. We see all the invoices coming through. We uh, were able to, to uh, negate invoices if they uh, if we feel like they're too high. We um, we have total control. And I think that's why we, we've seen a huge spike in performance of the property. We were doing everything right up front. But mm. when it came to the operations, we just couldn't we couldn't get an alignment of interest. And even if we don't make anything like on asset management, that's fine. It will come sooner or later. Just push as hard as you can, make sure the asset's going to perform now and um, just, just do good, do, make the property just perform. Absolutely. But, uh, scattered sites is, is a lot harder than say a 150, 200 unit site as well. It's when you're, when you're operating a bunch of scattered 40 and 50 unit properties. So third party property management is a little tougher. Absolutely. Yeah, we had a we had a gentleman on our podcast and uh, and we were talking like last last uh, last week, actually. And we were talking about exactly about this in-house property management and how much he said is day and night the difference. Right. This day and night the difference between in-house property management and third party company. Um, one thing that, that he mentioned, which I thought was a good point and I wanted to bring up because I think it, it would bring some value to the listeners, is that if you have a third party company. Right. And they're managing your property, but then they're also managing 10 other properties nearby. Why would they focus more on your property than all the other properties? If let's say there's a there's a unit that comes up, right? Why would they focus more on yours than all the other ones? Essentially, for them, you're just another number. You know, obviously it depends on the property manager. I know some are good, some are bad, um, but essentially you're just another number. But if you have that in-house property management, you guys are all in alignment of what you're trying to accomplish. So it's much, much. Uh, everybody's just in the same page, so everything just aligns a lot better. That was just kind of something I thought was was interesting. Well, and, and for and when you have a essentially two separate companies, like um, like you alerted to, the property management company is in for profit. They have to make money in order to make their own payroll, to make their own bills. To, so they've by default they have to fee the property. Mm. It's just way the way it is. If you if we're not relying on on our end, we're not relying on property management to uh, stand up our company. It's a part of the overall business plan. We want to make sure that our properties survive and thrive not uh, necessarily our property management company that's just mm. a part of the mix so it's um we, we see we see a huge difference it was uh it was tough at first but um you know it's i think it gets to a point in time where you almost have to bring it in house and become fully <clears throat> vertically integrated uh, I, I honestly i honestly think it's it's a learning path in the journey of a syndicator Yep. And that's something that you get to learn at the beginning when you're realizing, okay, this this makes a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah, and there's inst institutions will will they 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 look after or look for operators that are vertically integrated, not just relying on third party because you can truly compress the operational expenses when you're in alignment of interest through the uh, mm. construction phase to the prop project management, property management, asset management, everything's vertically aligned and not one company is <clears throat> trying to make more profit off of another one because it's, you distribute the expenses. So it's- Yeah, and, and we and we also had a conversation recently with the billionaire uh, of multifamily, of course, right? And his story was a little bit unique because he actually started by acquiring a property management company that had over 5,000 units. 
And then he ended up acquiring another property management that had another, I think, 5,000. So all in, he was at 10,000 units. Nice. Well, that, that gave him leverage to be able to go back and go to Wall Street and go to private equity firms and be like, hey, listen, this is what I have. And I see there's a big opportunity in the Sunbelt region. So that's why he was able to scale up because he had the infrastructure to be able to take on all these, you know, units and be able to manage it correctly. And, you know, now he's, you know, multi, multi billionaire. Uh, but essentially, I think that foundation is very, very critical. It could make you a break, I would say. Yeah. And usually they've got the f first right of refusal to sell the property for the owner. Um, so there's there, there's definitely a strategy there. I like that a lot. Um, very cool. Can you elaborate on your approach to, to adding value to the properties? What do you what do you look for? How much are you looking to spend? Uh, how much how much is it worth to spend in order to get the return? Are we looking at two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand? How heavy of a lift? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I know I know John can touch on it a little bit, but I would say it, typically, and in, in, in depends on the market, of course, right? If you're like in Charlotte, for instance, you might want to uh, you know spend a little bit more money on the units. But in the markets that we're investing in, C class, you know, B minus, uh, we're typically investing between five thousand, I think, five to seven thousand per unit, um, just to you know, quick, quick uh, paint, flooring, maybe paint the kitchen cabinets. Uh, so that's typically what we're what we're seeing. And essentially, we want to be able to to make that money back from the rent from the rents within the next you know three to five years. Essentially, that's kind of how we look at it. Um, but it's funny because in Canada, um, we're actually spending between thirty to thirty five thousand per unit because it's a yeah, it, which is a much it's a, there, there's a much higher end product that you have to perform. Um, but then also the rents, for instance, you know we're getting from seven uh, average seven hundred dollar a building, we're getting between sixteen hundred dollars. So you're able to push the rent by so much. So it does end up working out, but yeah, in the states, I said between five and seven thousand dollars. Uh, John, what do you think? Yeah, that is correct. Um, and this current asset that we currently have, the the capex plan is just to do flooring cabinets. Uh, thankfully enough, the all the properties come with uh, steel appliances already, which is um, a, a great plus. And we're doing a face lift off of the outside of the building so landscaping uh paint some pool furniture to bring the property back alive and uh, yeah i mean the rents can be pushed already by quite a bit so that's going to be able to draw a lot of young professionals that live nearby and be able to hit those performer rents um so yeah no really excited about it is that the one that you all have under contract in at, at, uh, georgia yeah yeah that's correct what uh what kind of debt did you all were you all able to get on that one well well you know what this one and i said the last two projects that we've seen and i think there's something you know that we're seeing that's very common because of the interest rates we're seeing that assumable loans are seem to be really attractive right now in terms of like they're they're there well as allowing us to really hit these numbers and cash flow and you know all these other things so we're is, is a assumable debt uh, this one has a assumable debt and uh, and yeah, a lot of the I think the last two or three projects that we've looked at, um, they all have come with a sum of a debt, you know, fixed rate for the next ten years, five five years of interest only. So really attractive terms, um, and that kind of allows us to mitigate the risk right now, which is interest rates. So I think that's uh, we're you know I'm not saying we're only going to buy these kind of assets currently, but these seem to be a really good um, asset class and you know and, and debt to be able to acquire these assets. So yeah, it has an assumable loan on it. Um, and I think it's at four, four and a half, four point five interest. But even the one that we were looking at before, we didn't end up purchasing this one, but we looked at another one and it had three point five percent interest only. Three point five percent interest fixed for the next like I think eight years or something, which was really, really phenomenal. But yeah, we're seeing that that a sum of a loan is, is a really good uh um way to mitigate the risk. Yeah, I, I agree, totally agree. If, if the assumable's uh, a great strategy as long as the uh, sellers don't uh, become totally unrealistic where you've got to bring a lot of high cost equity to the table and then even a supplemental because you still have a blended interest rate mm -hmm. that you have to maintain. So it can be really good on a primary debt interest rate. And then you, by the time you blend it, it's, it still doesn't make sense. So it's, um, it's things to watch out for. There, there's yeah. a lot of tripping hazards out there right now on just different, uh, different things in the, uh, in the market. Um, got still got sellers expectations on, on how much they feel like, they missed out on one of the highest, <laughs> the yeah, highest yeah, points yeah. in real estate. So it's, it's kind of like a bittersweet moment because it's yeah. not coming back in my opinion, anytime soon, maybe no. three to five years, but you know, I think it'll, I think it'll start. I think it'll wave. It'll ride the wave pretty high and maybe come down just a tiny bit, but not to what we used to be um, 
back yeah. in like 2018, 2019, for example. Um, and on this asset that we have under contract, mm -hmm. we were able to get a pretty good uh, loan of value at about 70% because of the DCR, the property so good. So we're um, pretty, pretty nice. excited about the numbers on that one. That's exciting. That's good. Yeah, and, uh, but, but, but what I wanted to say or what I wanted to add to, to what we were talking about earlier, um, Oh, never mind. I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but I, I think that uh, regardless, we've got a new value, um, a property value that's been created. So that that will be met and then exceeded uh, as far as the, how high the, the market reached. Just um, it's just going to take a little bit of time. I think interest rates ultimately will come down, whether it's next year or the year, I think the year after elections are next year so yeah anything can happen it's going yeah. to be in my my opinion turbulent times just because of the uh the environment but that's um if you can transact in this environment and in any environment which everyone should try to <coughs> then I feel like you'll be safe through the years it's got no that's smart exactly moves. that's exactly i've heard somebody say that there's somebody said uh a big syndicate i believe said that he said if you can make the deal make sense in this environment where insurance is high where you know interest rates are high, rents are not really going up as high as they used to be, right? If you can transact and the deal makes sense in this environment, you're going to be gold when the when the interest rates come down, when the environment changes, when the rental keeps going up. So I feel like you know you should obviously buy in all markets uh, as long as they're good deals and, and the deals make sense and you're mitigating the risk, um, kind of like what I mentioned earlier. But yeah, absolutely. What um what kind of due diligence do you all uh, perform once you have a property under contract? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the due diligence is obviously a. Um, it, there's a lot of moving pieces that I would say due diligence, but a big portion of what we've seen is that the property management, our in house property management, they do help out with a lot of the, you know, checking out the leases, making sure everything is as planned, going through all the units. I mean, we still do it, but I find that our property management, our in house property management has helped us a lot with, with that procedure. But yeah, typically what we do is we, we just make sure that all the leases match what the, what the seller had, had as advice us. We make sure there's no major, uh, major capital expenditure that we haven't really looked at. We, you know, we typically will go into every single one of the units. Um, you know, I, I know at some point it just becomes like repetitive. You're like walking through the same layout, but it's just part of the diligence. You want to make sure there's nothing hidden, nothing that you haven't been told. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, anything, John, you want to add to due diligence? No, I, <clears throat> I, I think like you said, the, you know, the T12, um, paperwork is, is extremely important and the inspection um i think that's where you're able to leverage a lot of the purchase price if you're able to have a good um a good uh a team member that can study the blueprints and the history of the building to make sure that okay what is up to date what is missing what wasn't disclosed properly and you know on a lot of the assets that we've been involved in canada before in the past and even this one in savannah you're able to leverage a good amount of the purchase price just off the prop just of the inspection um you know there's a lot of things that get you know missed um and that's where you're able to leverage a bit of um of the purchase price yeah yeah when we're going in and, and uh, our high level due diligence before the psa's Executed. We like to make sure that we we check everything out that we possibly can, and then do, of course, your your costs based on what ifs as well. I, mm. We still have we we've not rene renegotiated on price. I don't foresee us needing to unless there's something majorly substantial and it's going to inhibit our ability to close the property. But if we go in with the PSA of we're going to buy it for X and we're then that's what we're going to buy it for. Everyone's happy. There's mm. a balance. I mean, if something comes up, something comes up. You got to maintain that balance all the way through the closing. Like you had said, going through the units, it does come redundant, but you're also creating a brand new base for every unit in your property management software. So if you go in and digitally inspect the units, now you know if you move uh, Susie Jane in there, you already know what the unit's going to be, and you get your Reno team going in. So just creating a new base for your ownership to take over and just, um, just diligence. I think it just just helps. Uh, you know what to expect. Yeah, and I would say, and I would say the only thing I would add is, you know, you asked me earlier about passive investing, and this is also one of the benefits of being a passive investor is that you don't have to do due diligence. You just rely on the team, you know, the asset management team and the GP team to be able to do the due diligence in, in, in your behalf and obviously give you any reports that you might find. So that's also another benefit of investing passively is that you don't have to do. There's a lot of there's a lot of work with the diligence, um, but you know, if you can rely on a team, you know, that has a track record that has been doing this, that you, you, you know, you can, you can uh, synergize with, 
then essentially you don't have you can just rely on that and not have to do it yourself right yeah that totally there's a ton of pitfalls in real estate there's a i mean there's there's you can trip on your own shoestrings out there and, <clears throat> and land in a bad deal <laughs> absolutely just, yeah. i mean like for example you you can get so hyped about a deal at the beginning uh, and people don't understand how much you go through into a deal to actually be able to be like hey look i have this amazing project and they don't see all the work that was done before that i mean just under the diligence part right you got the environmental you got phase one you got phase two so you're still hoping that those things check out before you can even go out there and and, and present your deal make sure that there's you know no infrastructural uh, damages or mold or that the environmental comes back properly or that the phase two and the appraisal come back great so you know it, it's a long fight towards the end but um you know me and jeff were looking i think at about what close to a hundred deals we found before we found yeah. this one in Savannah, and you know it gets hard sometimes, right? You try not to give up because it's so many things that have to check out before you actually get a really good deal underhand. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. And there's like you said, a hundred, two hundred deals. You just, you keep on just flipping through the turds out there, yeah. and hopefully you find one good that actually pencils out. The seller's expectations aren't um, insane, and you know, everything's balanced. It works out. And then yeah, you, then you still have to get it, get everyone else to buy in and understand why it's such a good deal, and then uh, close the thing. So there's ton of moving parts. It's uh, exciting. It's uh, exhilarating, and uh, can be depressing. <laughs> after it's done so then, well, and after you close then it's the real work truly begins so it's not it's a uh, long fight it's a long fight yeah so very cool um all right so say one of the listeners wants to get a hold of you all how can they uh, reach out yeah so um you know we're very active on social media i think uh, i think you may attach the the um the social media links, but aside from that they can visit ortiz equity group which is our our last name o-r-t-i-z equitygroup.com um, and they can schedule a call with us we you know we do monthly webinars we do uh we do have a podcast very uh very much like this one uh it's called passive investing in u.s multifamily show and then we also do uh, monthly meetups in canada so you know we're pretty active social media instagram facebook TikTok. i mean yeah you'll be able to find us through through ortiz equity group but yeah that's uh we're very active on social media we love we love more than anything sharing sharing our journey you know yeah. sharing sharing um share what real estate can do real estate is a very powerful tool of using the right in the right way so you know we're just very grateful we we you know we don't really sell anything we just kind of bring value hope that people can can you know connect to our story connect to kind of what we do and basically attract investors instead of going out and trying to convince people to invest instead attract investors and attract them to our story and what we've been able to do yeah. Yeah. In real estate, you have to tell people what you're doing. It takes one person to see what you're putting out. They call you and say, Hey, I've got this deal. So if you're putting content out, you're pumping it out. You know what? We've been, uh, we've been seeing that in the last couple of weeks and uh, we're grateful for that for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's give it and it receives and you help people out along the journey and, and more than anything, just prove to other people that it can be done and you're proof if, um, if at all, if just anything. So I definitely love it. Love your guys' journey. I uh, look forward to following you all and we'll certainly talk soon. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank God. you for having Appreciate us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.